Well, hi, and welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams, and I'm here with my co-host, Billy Thomas, and we greatly appreciate you joining us today. Yeah, Renee, excited to be with you today. Another beautiful day here in Kentucky, and um, we're so delighted you all chose to be with us. Thank you so much. Um, if you're joining us via Zoom, you can interact with us um, via the chat pod. And if you're on Facebook Live, please use the comment section. We'll respond as quickly as possible. Renee, we've got a really good show today. We do. It's really exciting. I know. I am so excited. We have um, Susan Fox on. Susan is a county extension agent in Lyon County and an all-around great person. And she's going to be talking about native alternatives. You know, a lot of times we talk about a face of plants and some of these problems that they cause, um, but believe it or not, there are a great number of great alternatives and uh, native alternatives. Uh, She's I think that's it. why I'm so excited about this show, because we're always telling you what not to plant. I but know. Maybe we can actually tell you what to plant. So this is- Yes. Cool. Yeah, uh, me too. Um, and then we're also going to have our um, ever popular tree of the week. Um, one of our few pine trees is going to be featured today. And I'll just save that until we get that rolling. And then we have our very own Dr. Ellen Crocker going to be talking about those pesky plants. And she's got one that's really pretty. But it's also really problematic. So she'll Don't talk a little it. bit. Of, yeah, <laughs> she'll be talking about that a little bit later. Then we'll wrap it up with a preview of upcoming programs and the show topics for next month. So again, thank you all for being with us today. Definitely. So let's get started. So Susan's coming to us live from Lyon County. Okay. So um, I think one of the things is we tend to go to nurseries and buy what are in the nurseries and what we see in our neighbor's yards. And so as people are uh, being more concerned about invasives and trying to um, plant things that are good for wildlife and um, they're looking at native plants. And the thing is, is to know what native plants really work fairly well in the landscape and where you can get them. So we'll talk about that a little bit this morning. Oh, great, great. Really appreciate you doing it. And like I said, coming to us live from Lyon County. Um, well, so know, glad to have you. She's one of our county agents, so we, we really she appreciate is. You Yeah, so if you've got basically any question in the world, our county agents can handle it, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what you're doing there, Billy, don't yeah, you? Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. No, seriously, I mean, I, I try to brag on our county extension agents on this show all the time because you all really are the lifeblood of extension. And without you all kind of, you know, working so hard in the county level and working with our local constituents and extension would not be anything like it is so a big thanks to you susan and all of our agents here in kentucky thank you we appreciate what you all do too yeah. so and i'm right. glad to be part of the show today right. excellent Let's started and get on to uh okay. alternative are you ready for me to go yes, yes ma'am okay so I am not going to do landscape design. I'll put a caveat there, but um, the, the normal things that would apply with landscape design will apply when you're landscaping with native plants as far as what size tree you want where and what size shrub. So if you have that laid out, then you can go and look at your native plants and um, see what would work for you. Some of the reasons that we're looking at native plants is just the large amount of um, land around the world really that has been lost to native plants. And, and these um, native plants have grown to have relationships with fungi, with insects, with birds. And um, so it's, it's really a problem globally that we are, and we, we're having fairly large losses of insects and um, the bird populations are declining. So um, planting, if everybody plants some native plants, that can help to slow that loss down. Um, an example is Japanese stiltgrass. And they did a study where in this area where they found that the Japanese stiltgrass in the woods was benefiting wolf spiders and that the wolf spiders actually eat the little baby toads. And so they had a 65% decrease in the toads in these woods. So that just, you might look at that stiltgrass and say it's not hurting anything, but it does impact um, the environment. And one of the birds that we're, we have a decline on is the Carolina chickadee. And they take 6,000 caterpillars per brood so if you want to um, attract Carolina chickadees to your yard and support them, then having more native plants that um, the native insects will lay their caterpillars on um, will help support the Carolina chickadee. They're, they feed their young 6,000 caterpillars per brood. So that's, that's quite a few caterpillars. One of the books that I'm reading right now, I'm reading some of uh, Doug Tallamy. 
and um, he really looks at the native plants and how they support um, lepidopterans, or the, so you get the caterpillars, the worms that the birds use to feed their young, and oaks support, support 534 different kinds of butterflies and moths, where if you plant a ginkgo tree, there's about five that they found that would lay their eggs on a ginkgo tree. So you would have a lot more larva for a Carolina chickadee with an oak tree. Um, I'm actually gonna skip this one. So some of the common questions that we have are which plants are native? And I'm always looking at plants and trying to see if they're native. So that's kind of a learning process. Which ones work well in the garden? Could be, there are some that are kind of tears or just too weedy looking and your neighbors get upset with you and where can I buy them? And there are different philosophies. Some people only want what you find in the wild, but um, some of the cultivars will really help with planting in the landscape, I think, because they can double flowers. Maybe um, the way that flower is, the uh, pollinators may not be able to use it. So sometimes you can change it enough. So um, sometimes they can change the form enough that um, it affects how it interacts with the environment, the plant. So, but most cultivars are fine. So I'm gonna start in some ground covers for shade. I would say Allegheny Spurge is a really good one. I'm gonna list more on here than maybe what I can go into in detail. It's a little bit slow growing, but you can plant it instead of, um, it's a Pachysandra instead of the Japanese Pachysandra, which is um, pretty aggressive. You can do our, our native one. Um, this uh, Lakothe right here has a beautiful flower and this, uh, Kind of looks like a heath and um, that's a that's one that you could plant as a ground cover it's evergreen green and gold is one that some of my master gardeners have but it really it's this one down here but it really takes a lot of moisture so that one can be pretty neat as a ground cover it'll it'll form a pretty thick cover but um, it needs that moisture there are ferns the christmas fern will stay green all winter uh, ginger makes a wonderful ground cover this uh, is not a the best picture of ginger as a ground cover, but um, it's a really good one and um, pretty available. You can find wild ginger. I do have uh, some, I may have taken that out, strawberry. I probably have it on another page, but uh, wild strawberry can cover pretty well, but after a couple of years, it's fairly aggressive as a, as a spreader and the deer will graze it, but I'll, I'll show you a picture on the next page. And it's, it is one you can consider. And our common blue violet is pretty aggressive spreader and it actually has a fairly attractive leaf. Um, but you have to decide if you wanna deal with that or not. I really love the Canby's Mountain Lover. That's, this is it down here. That's a really nice mat forming about a foot tall. Um, and there are some other things uh, like bell warts that are good. So there's several good things that are ground covers for shade. The ephemerals, I won't go into much, but ephemerals were not, you know, they, they kind of come and you have that beauty in the spring and then they disappear and I just love seeing them. And most of them um, do pretty well, but I do have a caveat that if, if you find native orchids in the wild, um, don't dig them up and move them because they're very specific to a site. And um, it's, it's better to buy those than to dig them up and move them. They, a lot of times when you move them, they die. So, um, but there are a lot of neat plants that I love to see in the spring. The ephemerals kind of come up in the spring and then they wither and disappear. Um, so the ground covers for sun. Here is, here is the uh, violet and that's a nice leaf and it'll, be, it'll form a pretty thick cover. So you just have to decide if you want to deal with a plant that's fairly aggressive. Um, pink evening primrose is a native plant. This one here is the uh, strawberry, and you can see how thick it is. So it's these are this is at my house. So these are my day lilies, and it's almost choking out um, my day lilies. This Pennsylvania sedge makes a lovely ground cover, and it's one of the few sedges that will grow in full sun and tolerate dry conditions. So that's one to consider. Moss phlox is very widely available, and that actually is a native plant, and I think it looks really good hanging over a rock, rock wall or anywhere and kind of hang like that. Doesn't have a long bloom season, but it's really nice. 
Um, one of the best ones that we found is this rose vervain and it will bloom from early spring on into fall. It does like full sun. Um, it can take a little bit of shade, but I had it in, in uh, a fair amount of shade and, and it wasn't blooming too well for me, but um, it, if it gets some sun, it does real well. This bear berry over here in the corner, I would really like to try, I don't have it, but it takes a sandy or rocky soil, stony soil, it does not like clay. So that would be a specific condition, but it would be a neat one to grow. So those are some for sun. If you're gonna plant a vine, probably the most common one is this coral honeysuckle down here in the corner. It's a really nice vine and the hummingbirds like it. Um, a couple of them that are unusual would be this pipe vine or this vase vine. The pipe vine, the pipe vine swallowtail needs um, for its larva. So that's one specific, there's a specific butterfly for that one. And this is the plant right here. So that's a pretty cool one. We do have our own native um, bittersweet. So if you plant the native bittersweet and not the American, um, that's a, a good thing to, um, to grow instead of the, the invasive foreign bittersweet. And then we have our native wisterias. So, and the best one probably is Blue Moon, the Macrostachia. Um, it has a good fragrance. Amethyst Falls is on the market. I've seen it, but the flowers unfortunately smell like cat pee. So that's probably one you want to avoid. And I really love passion flowers, but they are very aggressive. So I hear people talking about that. And, um, you know, you, you might not want to have passion flower. The cross vine and the trumpet creeper um, are also good native ones that the hummingbirds like, but they are large vines. And you have to be aware of that if you plant them. So some grasses that are great in the landscape. I, I put river oats in here. I love river oats, but they come up everywhere. So if you plant river oats, um, you need to uh, be careful with them. Pink muley grass is beautiful. Prairie drop seed, purple love grass, little blue stem um, are all good grasses to use. But river oats, I would plant in a na native area where they can kind of do their thing and not be a, a hassle to you. Um, some of the herbaceous perennials for shade. The, my number one is uh, the uh, Indian pinks, which is up here. That's just a beautiful plant. It can take a, a fair amount of sun. It can take part shade um, and it comes up native. It's in the ditches around where I live in the woods, shaded woods areas. Um, the fi uh, fire pinks. This spider lily I think is gorgeous um, and it's in the woods around here. And I think it can take some sun and then if this one is really cool in the lower right, this is green dragon, which is an arum. And in a good garden setting, it'll get three feet tall and it's in the Jack and the pulpit family. So it'll have the neat um, berries in the fall. So I think it's just kind of sculptural and, and I like it. So um, Jacob's ladder is a great one. I don't have a picture of it on here, but um, has purple flowers and is a really nice one. Um, herbaceous perennials for sun. Uh, this is Calico Beard's Tongue here, Maryland Golden Aster. Um, the Royal, this is Royal Catchfly, which is like a fire pink, but bigger. Um, this is Golden Alexander. And most of these we've grown in gardens. Um, so we know that they do pretty well. Wild Bergamot, Wild Bergamot does get powdery mildew. Um, maybe does a little better in a meadow setting. It's a fairly tall plant. Um, Scarlet bee balm is shorter and has this beautiful red flower. So there's some native goldenrods that you can plant like, um, and you probably want it like the zigzag goldenrod. You probably want to go with something that's a little bit um, less aggressive. This is the common um, goldenrod here in a wild area and the bees do love it in this frost aster in the fall, but um, they're a little weedy looking. So you probably don't want that in, in your landscape in general, unless you have a kind of a wild area. Um, I love this blue star grass and I have found I have to mark it because I'll pull it up as a weed because it does look like a grass until it blooms. So um, that, if you plant that one, you might want to mark it and make sure you know so you don't pull it up accidentally in the spring. Um, there are some native St. John's warts and I don't have a picture of them here. There, St. John's warts are really cool plants. Um, they'll have a yellow flower and then they'll get a red berry on them that's pretty. Um, and they're, they can be 
semi evergreen. So that's a, a nice plant for the landscape. Um, you have to be careful. There are native St. John's warts and then there are some that come from Asia. Um, so you have to kind of take a look at that. There are some that, in, that are invasive. Um, and then blue star, this is not a good picture. And you can see some river oats popping out of it, um, which is because they, they come up everywhere. But blue star gets covered with blue flowers in the spring. It gets about three feet tall. It's a pretty, it's a really nice shrub. And then there's Hubrichtii and Tabernay Montana. And Hubrichtii has a fernier leaf. Cabernet Montana has got a, a larger leaf, but they both get covered with blue flowers. And then the Hubertii gets a really pretty yellow gold, yellow brown color in the fall. So it's got a nice fall color too. There's Rose Mallow is, is a beautiful native flower and it, you can buy all kinds of cultivars online right now, different colors, um, white, scarlet, pink, um, so that's a really neat flower. The uh, Japanese beetles like it, but you might have to spray it for that. There's aster. Stokes aster is a nice short aster that you can plant that doesn't get really big. Um, I love Baptisia, and that's this one in the lower left corner. And you can get chocolate ones and white ones, and there's a yellow species. Um, that, now it'll form a bush about three, three feet tall and fairly round. It's, it's a nice shaped bush. And then it gets these seed pods on it that are interesting. Um, liatris is wonderful for butterflies and there are several species of liatris that you can plant. Um, I really like that one. I put ironweed in here and I have some ironweed but I put a caveat with ironweed because it, it is kind of invasive in pastures and if you, if you have pastures it might not be one that you want to use. Same thing with maybe joe pie weed but they, they both attract butterflies and they're good um, good for wildlife. Milkweeds, lots of milkweeds. Um, orange, the uh, butterfly milkweed is the most common and is really good landscape plant. And I don't have a picture of it here, but this is the swamp milkweed and it needs a wet area, but it's pretty and not too invasive. This one is the red ring, which is more in the woods, open shade. And it's, it's not invasive either. I think it's kind of a neat flower. And this one is growing um, in a ditch in my area. It's very less common. It's hard to find. It's um, purple milkweed and it's not very invasive either. And I have transplanted one of them home, but I've a lot, the flower died on it. So maybe next year I'll be able to collect some seed from it and propagate it. This is common milkweed to the left. And I just, I, I don't really um, encourage people to plant it because it, it is um, pretty invasive, but the insects love it. If you look at all these other pictures, I don't see an insect on any of them. I'm sure the butterflies do use them. But if you look at this one, it's, it's probably got 30 insects on it. And it has a really good fragrance, but it just comes up everywhere and it's a little bit invasive and not quite as pretty. Um, so you can use it, but you probably wanna use it in more of a naturalized area. Home flowers, lots of them. They're very good for wildlife and pretty, and you can get shorter ones and taller ones. And, um, you know, I, th I just think this uh, gray headed cone flower is really neat. I've got some of it coming up. It's a taller one. Um, and then the purple cone flower with that orange center, it's really quite a contrast. And I just love it. Here's a mass of orange cone flowers from Beth Wilson's garden. Really neat effect when you, when you have it in mass like that. There are sunflowers that get taller. Jerusalem artichoke you can plant um, and uh, you can eat the roots if you get hungry, <laughs> they're edible. Or if you just wanna kind of go, go native, go wild and eat some wild things, um, you can eat Jerusalem, Jerusalem artichoke tubers. Rhododendrons. Um, are, uh, there's native rhododendrons that grow in the mountains, so maybe they're not real common in western Kentucky, but I take some license there and I would, I've got rhododendrons planted. Beautiful in the right place. Um, there's decid this is a, a rhododendron here, and then there's deciduous azaleas where they lose their leaves in the winter, um, but beautiful in the spring. Some other plants for shade, the pawpaw is a great understory um, tree has this large fruit on it that's edible and it has a nice yellow leaf in the winter that's, uh, or in the fall, that's a great color. There's hop hornbeam is a tree that's got these neat flowers and Carolina silver bell. There's one called bladder nut. 
So um, lots of the uh, winterberry hollies or possum haw, this is possum haw in the lower right, is a native holly that's deciduous. Uh, lots of great understory plants. The shrubs for sun, we, I already showed you blue star. Uh, this is New Jersey tea up here, or this is pepper bush right here, okay. Um, has a neat flower on it. Um, this is Carolina allspice, has a, it can have a banana, strawberry, pineapple fragrance, really neat flower. This is button bush and there is a button bush that just got, so this is a wild one, but there is one called Magical Moonlight, just got the 2021 Theodore Klein Award that's a little more compact and um, it's, it's really got a nice leaf and a nice shape to it. It's, it's a rounded bush. So there is button bush that you can get that will feed the butterflies and also the birds eat the fruit. Um, this is New Jersey tea down here, which makes a nice plant um, and little flowers on it. Here is a winterberry holly. So you have the red fruit going into winter that will feed the birds. Um, this is uh, Amsonia hubrichtii right here. And then this is uh, nine bark. And this is summer wine that has the purple leaves and this is a green leaf variety. So those, those are very attractive shrubs. American beauty berry doesn't actually grow in Kentucky. It grows in Tennessee, but I think we could take a little license and plant that one. I don't have the berries on here, but I think most people are familiar with the purple berries that get on it. And so that's a nice native that you could plant as well. So some more, I guess we're getting into some large shrubs, small trees. And in that category, this is white fringe tree flowers. And the only thing with that is the emerald ash borer is gonna come and probably take those out because uh, they, besides ash, they do like to get the fringe trees, but it has a nice flower. This one is uh, a sourwood and the bees love sourwood. And I have one planted at home and mine's just now starting to take off and flower. It sat for two or three years and didn't grow and this year it's this spring it finally took off and it actually bloomed so I'm I have hope for it now it's really kind of a neat tree and has a nice flower on it this one here is yellow wood and I don't have one of these yet I'm it's it's on my list of things to get it has these flowers that hang down kind of a really nice Kentucky tree the bottle brush buckeye right here and the um, red buckeye in the lower right corner um, are both native plants the hummingbirds like them but they do have poisonous, they are poisonous. The, the nuts that come off of them are poisonous. So they grow around here. I've never heard of any poisonings from them, but people should be aware that if you have a dog that eats everything or a kid that wants to put everything in their mouth that, you know, you may not want that, those trees, but they are a beautiful tree and I see them in the landscape around here. And I have a couple at home, but mine aren't picture worthy yet. Dogwoods, of course, are great um, in the landscape. And then uh, red buds are native. And the cool thing about red buds is they, they've got several cultivars now. They've got this one that's kind of the rising sun that's got this peachy chartreuse color in the leaves. You can get uh, forest pansy that's purple. And um, so there's some neat color that you can add to the, add to the landscape in those trees. So sources. Um, is, these are really not nurseries, but for information, this is a great publication, Kentucky's Native Alternatives to Invasive Plants that lists plants that you might plant in your garden and then um, alternatives to them. So that's a, a really nice resource. In putting this together, I looked at NRCS database. There's several UK publications, some by Robert Anderson on trees. The Kentucky Native Plant Society has great information and they have a Facebook page where we share a lot of information, a lot of discussion going back and forth. The Missouri Botanical Garden plant profiles are great um, and I use those a lot. Tom Barnes Blogspot has information on native plant profiles. The UK Hort Department has uh, native trees um, listings and information on them. Of course, the forestry department has um, a good website with common trees. I also refer to some of the native nurseries. There's prairie moon, ironweed, and there's other plant nurseries that have great information online and where you can actually get the plants. And then Armitage's Native Plants for North American Gardens is a good read too. So here is um, some more on the seed and plant sources. Roundstone is great, it's in Kentucky. Um, ironweed is in Kentucky. Their Prairie Moon is actually out of Minnesota, but they do have great information on their website and, and there are people ordering from them. 
And then there's a Missouri wildflower nursery that has a great catalog. So there are more natives that are being carried by the even the box stores and you can look around and find quite a few. And that's it. So that's my dog and that is a New Jersey tea behind him but he's he's sitting on a on a sedum that is not native, but he thinks it's more comfortable than the, than the um, and the mulch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, he sits on it. He prefers to sit on it. <laughs> well, so. thank you so much. That was so informative. We greatly appreciate that. And, you know, I really appreciated how you did some sun and, you know, and then shade because like I would, when you would, I was writing some down as you were talking of what I should, you know, get, because I was like, oh, well, that one's in this shade. And then I was like, oh, there's a sun, you know, <laughs> so, so I went far I was, too long, didn't I? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's great. Hey, fortunately, we recorded it so we can, um, everybody can check out the recording of it a little bit later. Um, you know, Susan, I just wanted to thank you for that. I really, um, you know, I, I knew some of those plants, but you really introduced us to some beautiful Kentucky natives. Um, that um, I, I was unfamiliar with, and I'm sure some of our viewers were as well. So, you know, given all that you showed us, I don't think there's much reason to pick anything other than a native plant to, you know, plant in your landscape. So um, really nice presentation. Yeah, we greatly appreciate all your help with that. Yes, uh, Susan, appreciate you very much and um, keep up the good fight. And, and thanks again for spending some time with us today. All right. So we're moving on and, and you know, she just told us what to plant. Right. Now we're going to go to Ellen, Dr. Ellen Crocker to tell us, don't plant this. <laughs> well, you know, and it's really fitting because Ellen's about to show us something that's really pretty <laughs> and might be attractive to a lot of people, but there's some problems, right? It is, that's so true. And I think this is true with a lot of, you know, what become our invasive plants. Because it's not like uh, the plant sets out to be an invader and it's inherently bad, but um, when things are invasive, so an invasive Basic plant is something that's not native to here and that it's a problem. You know, it's a problem ecologically. It'll take over where it could be native plants that kind of play well together and you get this diverse community. Instead, you just get this sea of this one invasive that, as Susan mentioned, a lot of them don't really have the same relationships with our native insects and wildlife. Uh, maybe some insects like them, but not the diversity of different native insects. And certainly if you just got a sea of this one thing, it's not as good. Um, and a lot of these invasive plants are things that are were popular ornamentally because, hey, they grow great. We know that about them. And they do something else that we like. And this is one that every summer all get emails about, what's this beautiful plant? I love its flowers. And it does have really eye-catching flowers. But um, as our previous presenter showed, there are so many great native alternatives that will not only give you something beautiful, not only give something to those insects, but also be a better fit for your landscape setting that I wanted to highlight as well. Um, so today we're going to learn a little bit about mimosa, um, also called silk tree, and um, you know what it is, what it looks like, uh, and encourage you to, to enjoy it if you see it, but maybe remove it from your property um, and plant something else. Enjoy it until you cut it down, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. All right. What's that beautiful tree? This time of year, you might see mimosa blooming and be really impressed by its attractive pink flowers. It goes by many names in addition to mimosa, like silk tree or albizia. But despite its real appeal during the summertime when it's blooming, it's not a good choice for your landscape for a number of reasons. Um, it will fall apart fast, but it's also invasive. In today's edition of Pesky Plants, I'm gonna talk about mimosa, what it is, and some great native alternatives for your landscape. Mimosa is a small tree and it can grow up to 40 feet tall but frequently is much smaller. It can have a vase-like form with trees wider than they are tall but frequently it's more of a shrubby form with multiple stems. Mimosa has doubly compounded leaves with lots of tiny leaflets. Because of this, mimosa can have a lush, fern-like canopy appearance. In midsummer, typically June, mimosa flowers with outrageous, fragrant flowers, pink pom-poms covering the tree. It looks like a tree that stepped out of a Dr. Seuss book. Mimosa is in the pea family, and as its fruits start to develop from those flowers, you'll notice that in that they're kind of 
pea-like shaped seed pods. When it's flowering, mimosa is pretty distinctive, but those compound leaves could be confused at other times of year for other trees and maybe smaller plants that have those compound leaves, things like locusts. Mimosa is native to Asia and it was actually introduced to North America as far back as the 1700s as an ornamental plant. Mimosa will thrive anywhere where it has lots of light, so a wide range of different habitats and conditions. It really likes edge habitat as well as disturbed areas, so you'll see it most frequently along roadsides and in old fields, but it can also invade in those wetter areas like stream sides. Mimosa is cold hardy up to zone six, um, so it's unlikely to really move into colder areas because of that. As beautiful as it is, mimosa is not a great choice for your landscape. It's invasive. It will take over areas faster than our native species can. All of those seed pods produce seed that will rapidly colonize. In addition to that, though, it's just not a great choice for a number of reasons. It falls apart fast and is not a long-lived tree. In addition, it's pretty messy with those flowers and then seed pods going everywhere. And it has pretty invasive roots that are shallow and can come into conflict with houses and other structures. As with any invasive plant, managing mimosa is gonna require persistence and patience. The first thing I'd recommend is scouting and being on the lookout for mimosa, especially if you have populations in your area. Think of things that might give it a great opportunity to take hold, disturbances, whether that's um, a new road going in, a harvest, or even an ice storm. If you have other mimosa in your area, it's likely that seed's gonna come in during that time and seedlings will get started. Young seedlings can be pulled up with relative ease, especially if the ground is moist, but you really need to make sure to get all of that root system because if any roots are left, it can shoot right back up from there. For those larger trees, you could look at a basil bark application of an herbicide or a cut stump approach um, where you cut the tree down and then paint its stump with herbicide to prevent that root system from sprouting back up. If you have smaller trees, you could also use a foliar spray herbicide, but you want to be careful not to spray any of the other vegetation around, those native species that you want to keep. With mimosa, like other invasive plants, it's also important that you exhaust the seed bank. So all of the seeds that that mimosa plant was producing are going to be there in the ground, and they're going to continue sprouting up for five or more years down the road. So you want to continue monitoring, pulling up those small seedlings, and not letting them get established. Otherwise, they'll be a lot harder to control. You can still find mimosa sold in stores, but it's a nuisance that takes over and is not a good selection for your landscape. If you're looking for a great smaller tree with beautiful flowers, um, there are lots of native alternatives out there. I really recommend you look at redbud, at many of our flowering dogwood, at yellow woods, at white fringe tree, and others that will give you everything you want in terms of that beautiful flower, but something that's gonna be a little bit better in your landscape setting. Thanks for joining me today and learning a little bit more about mimosa. If you want to learn more about this and other invasive plants, make sure to check us out online and follow us on social media. Keep up the good fight against those invasive plants and promoting the health of your woodlands. Well, thank you, Ellen. That one, I really like that. It, and you do have to admit that is a really pretty tree. Oh, definitely. Okay. And you know, I, I get why people like it. It's something different in your landscape setting, but there are so many other great alternatives out there that also give you really interesting flowers. Um, one of the ones that Susan mentioned, that uh, red flowering buckeye, I mean, that's unusual as well. You don't see that all the time either, um, but I, I recommend. Um, another thing to think about mimosa is not only is it invasive, um, whether that's you know in your yard locally, but also in our natural areas, which is the real problem that I see, um, you know, it, it falls apart, it's not great, and it's susceptible to a lot of different uh, kind of insect and disease problems. So just avoid it. <laughs> Pick something else. As Susan said, there's a lot of it here along the roads. Um, oh, yeah. uh, you, can, you can do better. So now yeah. are birds probably transporting these seeds? 
or not? I don't know about those seeds. They're pretty papery, those seed mm. um, uh, pods and the seeds inside of them. Uh, I'm sure they can move on their own though. Um, oh, one yeah. thing to note is that they don't actually transplant very well, uh, despite the fact that you can find them sold. So if you dig it up, uh, that's probably not gonna work um, uh, for, for transplanting it. Um, but uh, the, the root system is, is really invasive and it's really hard to, rem if you don't get all of it, it's just going to shoot right back up from there. Oh, no. Well, thank you no. very much. We greatly appreciate it. I'm yeah, just glad as always, yes. other alternatives that we can, we can plant to make our landscaping beautiful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Susan. It was a great presentation. Yeah. yeah yes. Indeed. And Alan, thank you. Really appreciate our pesky plants all the time. Um, you know, we need to be on the lookout for these boogers. So thank you. Yeah, we really thank look you. forward to having this once a month. <laughs> yeah. Talk with you soon. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you. All right. Going on with our ever popular tree of the week, you exactly. know, the, so Laurie couldn't be with us today, but she's going to, she did prepare a video for one of the few pine trees in Kentucky. You know, people may not realize it, but really the vast majority of our trees are what we call hardwoods. You know, they lose their leaves in the fall, mostly oak and hickory. Um, but we do have some pine trees in the state, you know, a handful that are native to the state. And we're going to be featuring one of those now. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resource Extension. And I'm here with the tree of the week, the shortleaf pine. Shortleaf pine, Pinus echinata, is one of the commercially important southern yellow pines. And depending upon locale, the species is also called shortleaf yellow pine, southern yellow pine, old field pine, short straw pine, or Arkansas soft pine. It is a medium to large pine that grows 80 to 100 feet tall and up to 2 to 3 feet in diameter. The tree typically has a clear straight trunk with small somewhat pyramid shaped crown. Shortleaf pine is relatively slow growing and shade intolerant, and it reaches maturity at 170 years, at 170 years of age, but may live much longer. Shortleaf pine has the widest geographic range of any pine in the southeastern United States. It's found in 22 states, and Arkansas has more shortleaf pine than any other state. Shortleaf pine has great adaptability for soils, moisture, and temperature, this is the hardiest and most adaptable of the southern pines. However, it grows best on moist, well-drained, deep, sandy, or silty soils. It commonly grows in even age stands, but in Kentucky it grows in a mix of oak pine stands on dry uplands. It is a pioneer species that commonly invades old fields that have been abandoned from agriculture. Shortleaf pine is generally fire resistant, but wildfires in young plantations in the south um, can be damaging. The crowns are usually killed, but young shortleaf pine has the remarkable ability to re-sprout after the main stem is destroyed by fire or cutting. And fire is an important a management tool for shortleaf pine. Fire effectively prepares the necessary seabed for regeneration and can be used con to control competing hardwoods. The Shortleaf Pine Initiative was launched in the spring of 2013 in response to the dramatic decline of this pine. Over the last 30 years, there has been a more than 50% decline in shortleaf pine e ecosystems, with the most significant declines east of the Mississippi River. Extensive logging, subsistence farming, the loss of open-range grazing of livestock, and the lack of appropriate disturbances such as fire for subsequent regeneration have contributed to a decline in its range since 1980. The Shortleaf Pine Initiative was formed to develop a wide-range conservation, conservation plan for shortleaf pine to identify optimum restoration strategies, increase coordination among shortleaf proponents, and maximize the effectiveness of ongoing efforts. The Shortleaf Pine Initiative represents a broad range of public and private organizations as well as key state and federal agencies working in the shortleaf pine ecosystems. Shortleaf pine is an evergreen conifer with needle-like leaves. The needles are in bundles or fascicles of twos and threes, as you can see in the photo. The needles are typically three to five inches long, they're slender and they're flexible. And they're typically dark yellow, green, more of a green in color. And the needles will typically persist two to four years. Shortleaf pine is monoecious, which means a tree has both male and female flowers. The flowers of shortleaf pine are cone-like structures. And the male flower is yellow green to reddish purple before ripening to a brown when the pollen is shed. 
The female flower is green to red to purple, and the female flowers emerge shortly after the male flowers. The flowers are wind pollinated in the spring. The fruit of shortleaf pine is a cone, a pine cone. The cones are egg-shaped and about two inches long and they're nearly sessile and they're green when they're immature. They tend to be a red to brown in color and have a small prickle or spike as they ripen. The pine cones mature in the fall of the second growing season. And once the cone ripens and dries out in late October to early November, the bracts open and the winged seeds fall out, usually landing relatively close to the parent tree. And about 90% of the seeds fall within the first two months of opening. The seeds overwinter on the ground and those remaining germinate the following spring. However, many of the seeds are eaten by small mammals and birds. Shortleaf pine begins seed production around 20 years of age with a good seed crop every 3 to 10 years. And the cones will persist on the tree long after they are empty. Shortleaf pine seeds are an important food source for birds and small mammals over the lean winter months. And deer browse the seedlings and saplings which also provide cover for wild turkey and bobwhite quail. The older, mature to overmature shortleaf pines with red heart rot provide habitat for cavity nesting birds. In fact, they are the primary nesting trees for the federally endangered red cockaded woodpecker. The decline of older, mature shortleaf pines has resulted in a decline in the population of red cockaded woodpecker. Shortleaf pine is also the larval host of the elfin butterfly. The bark on shortleaf pine is dark and rough and scaly on young trees, but as the tree ages, the bark becomes more of a reddish brown and it's broken into flat, scaly plates. And the plates have small surface pockets that are about the size of a pencil point, which are resin or pitch pockets. And this is a good characteristic to use in tree identification when you can't get to the needles. It's easy to tell shortleaf pine from pitch pine because shortleaf pine has pitch pockets and pitch pine does not have pitch pockets. Go figure. The wood of shortleaf pine is straight grained with fine to medium with a fine to medium texture. It's hard, dense, and has excellent strength to weight ratio. The heartwood is a reddish brown and the sapwood is yellowish white. The heartwood is rated as moderate to low in decay resistance. Overall, it works fairly well with most tools, though the resin can gum up tools and clog sandpaper. Shortleaf pine glues and finishes well. Shortleaf pine is used in heavy construction, such as bridges, beams, poles, railroad ties, etc. It's also used for making plywood and veneer and flooring and pulpwood. Even the tap roots are used for pulpwood, and the oleoresins from the tree are extracted to make turpentine. The national champion shortleaf pine is in Smith, Texas. It's 154 inches in circumference, 91 feet tall, with a 66-foot crown spread. The Kentucky Champion is in McCreary County in the Daniel Boone National Forest. It's 93 inches in circumference, 139 feet tall, with a 36-foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest National Register of Champion Trees or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about shortleaf pine. A unique feature of shortleaf is the ability of young trees to sprout following fire. This sprouting ability is due to the development of a pronounced J-shaped crook at or below the ground surface. In the crook, numerous dormant buds develop which allow sprouting if the top is killed. During the Revolutionary War in the early 1800s, shortleaf pine was a major timber source in the eastern part of its range for a variety of products, including shipbuilding and homes. In the western portion of its range, shortleaf pine dominated the forest industry during the mid to late 1800s and early 1900s until the Great Depression. It was so highly valued that loblolly pine timber was marketed as shortleaf. The scientific genus name Pinus is Latin for pine, and the species name Echinata is from the Greek, Greek echinos, which means hedgehog or prickly, in reference to the cone scales. Thanks for joining me today to learn about this pine. I hope you get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, local park, or neighborhood and enjoy the superb shortleaf pine. Well, you know, Billy, it's always a pleasure watching those. You always learn so much about trees. 
No, Laurie does such a good job with those. And, you know, folks, if you haven't seen them, we've got more than 50 of these videos available independently on our Common Trees of Kentucky website. So um, make sure you check that out. Um, it's, it's a great resource that Laurie's put together for us. So big thanks to her for that. And I'm correct in saying there's like 120 Common Trees of Kentucky, right? So yeah, so in that ballpark, out. right? Yeah, so she's still plugging oh, along. Yeah, so we've got at least another year of this, and then we might have to start venturing out a little bit from there. But um, no, she's doing great with that series for sure. So. Well, you know what? Speaking of, today is the mm -hmm. last day, and we're moving on this year already, half over. Um, and, you know, we, but you've got some um, events coming up for July that we need to know about. We, we do. So I'm going to kind of cover our little. Um, upcoming programs in July. And I'm telling you, we've got a, one of our biggest events starts in July that our entire team is part of. And um, I'll go ahead and get that shared. All right, so here we are in our July programming. Um, appreciate um, you all being with us on a weekly basis. So we wanna give you a little preview of things coming up um, next month. All right, the big one is our Woodland Owner Short Course. This is our flagship program as far as like everybody's involved with it on our UK Forestry and Natural Resources Extension team. It also involves the Kentucky Division of Forestry, County Extension Agents, Fish and Wildlife, um, Natural Resources Conservation Service, Consulting Foresters, Woodland Owners Association, and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm telling you, this is a great opportunity. If you're interested in anything about woodlands in Kentucky, this is the program for you. And this year we're doing it both online and in person. Um, we're going to start off on July 27th with an online session. I'll be leading that session on the five W's of woodland management in Kentucky. We're going to try to go over the who, what, when, where, and why, um, and a little bit about how to go about managing your woodlands here at the state. Um, and then Dr. Ellen Crocker is going to be on on July 29th with our Woodland Health. Um, on August 3rd, we're going to have Dr. Jacob Muller talking about woodland management practices in Kentucky. And then on August 5th, Dr. Matt Springer is going to wrap up our online sessions with one on wildlife management practices. And then Renee, the ideal is that um, people that participate in this program will watch these webinars. We will record them. So in case you can't make it those exact night, the recordings will be available for you. And the hope is, is that people that are participating in the Woodland Owner Short Course this year will watch those sessions in advance of coming to join us on our field session. So we have field sessions in all three regions of the state, in the west, the central, and the east parts of the state. And those online sessions are going to be a lead-in to those field sessions. So if you're out in Western Kentucky, we're gonna be out there in Princeton um, on August 14th. And um, it's on the back part of the UK research farm down there. We'll get your detailed directions um, once you register for that event. And then on August 21st, we're gonna be at Robinson Forest. Now, the, our whole team was down at Robinson Forest yesterday, um, scouting out and getting ready for the Woodland Owner Short Course that's gonna be taking place down there on August 21st. And if you've never seen Robinson Forest, this is a great opportunity to get, um, get down there and check out this amazing resource. It is absolutely beautiful, and there's lots to show and tell down there about. And then on August 28th, we're going to be at the State Arboretum at Bernheim. Um, Bernheim is hosting us, and we're going to be out at their Woodland Pavilion area out there on August 28th. So please um, join us. Registration is available now, and you can um, get on and, and register. It is $15 for an individual and $25 for a couple. Um, and that will cover your lunch for the day at the field session, as well as some of the resource uh, materials, uh, including a nice binder that we will be giving to you. So please um, share the word. If you know anybody that owns Woodlands or anybody that cares about Woodlands in Kentucky, this is the program for them. It really is. So. Definitely. And they're going to learn a lot of information in those online sessions. And then later on, kind of show what we were talking about on those online sessions and show put some hands on the ground and kind of show them what we were talking about so yeah. I think you, get it, you get it double that way which always helps anytime you're trying to learn anything I think so. And I'm, we're really excited about this format. Our team is really excited and energized. And, you know, Renee, we're just so excited to be able to meet with woodland owners, you know, face to face this year. So um, we're really looking forward to it. So please um, plan to join us. And, and again, please help us spread the word about this great opportunity. 
All right. Next thing I want to kind of discuss is our show lineup for next month. So in July, we've got another jam-packed schedule, as always. You know, Renee, you do such a great job of helping coordinate and getting great speakers lined up for these sessions. So a big thanks to you for all that work. I know it's a lot, um, but we're going to be talking about what's wrong with my oak. So, you know, we hit, we get lots of questions about oak trees and, uh, you know, are they okay? Are they sick? What's wrong with it? What's going on? Um, Dr. Ellen Crocker will be helping us out um, discovering what's wrong with my oak. And then I'm going to be covering a separate and a, a session on options for woodland owners on July 14th. You know, most of our woodlands are privately owned by individuals and families here in the state of Kentucky. And what they do with those woodlands not only has an impact on that family, but it has an impact on their county and the state overall. So we're going to be talking about some of the different options that are available for woodland owners when it comes to trying to care for and manage their woodland property. And then we're going to be um, having Dr. Ellen Crocker back on July 21st talking about Laurel Will. This is a relatively new um, issue that we're dealing with, so she'll be bringing us up to speed on what's going on with that. Um, and then we're going to wrap up July on um, the 28th with Dr. Um, Larson, our resident entomologist, um, that's going to be with us talking about some of those woodland bugs. So um, he always puts on a great show, so we're looking forward to having him. And, you know, Renee, I'm really looking forward to next month some schedule on From the Woods today. Yes. Well, um, you know, and the thing about it is, Billy, without our viewers, this wouldn't even be possible. And, you know, they can always go to fromthewoodstoday.com and submit topics. I mean, you know, you mentioned about the different topics that we were going through in July, but if there's something that they want to see, they need to just let us know. I mean, and you never know, we might submit it on the show. We've had snake ID and things like that of people who have submitted things. So, um, you know, it's just one thing that uh, if, we, if we people need to know about it, then we would like to know, you know, let them know if, if we have any details on that. So it's always yeah. helpful if, if people let us know what they want to hear about. No doubt. You know, we want to make this a service to um, all of our viewers. So um, as Renee said, let us um, be a better service to you if we can. So um, yeah, thank you all so much. Really appreciate you being part of us. Um, oh, summer bat habitats. Oh, all right. We'll, we'll uh, float that one by Dr. Matt Springer and um, see if we can't get that one covered. Good suggestion there. Um, all right. Well, you know what? That's all we have for today. Um, again, you can always go to fromthewoodstoday.com. I know we gave you a lot of information, um, so you might want to go back uh, maybe by the end of uh, next week and watch our show, and you can write down some of those sun alternatives or shade alternatives. I know I was doing that, and I'll probably <laughs> go back to write some of those down um, just to get those get those names, but uh, we post yeah. every show that we have there um, if you uh, want to end up doing that and watch them again. Yeah, yeah, it, it, indeed. So yeah, check out that great content. There's tons of it. And you know, again, we appreciate y'all being with us weekly and helping us kind of spread the word about From the Woods today. Great. All right. So uh, we will see you next week on Wednesday at 11. Until then, take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.